In this video, Dr. Andras Pelianis, PhD in Computer Engineering, PhD in Biology, PhD in Physics, founder of Whole Tech Incorporated in Sunnyvale, California, discusses the revolution occurring in genomics, epigenomics, and proteomics because of his discovery of fractal patterns in the genetic programming of species. His objective is to account for disorders, diseases, and preventable deaths in humans by better understanding how our genetic systems work. Excerpts and captions done by John Aller were authorized by Dr. Pelianis in writing. Dr. Pelianis holds multiple patents and is the winner of international prizes, including the Pentagram Prize of India. 2007 was a very big year in genome informatics. There was an explosion of information. In Nature and in different other journals, Francis Collins, who, was, who actually led uh, a, a group in NIH, they came up with, with a four-year study essentially saying that the scientific community will need to rethink some long-held views because they were wrong. And then he resigned, and they're uh, playing guitar and riding a motorcycle. So uh, uh, basically what is happening, that uh, a genome informatics explosion meant that uh, this junk DNA uh, is not true, it's not junk, it can also be functional. The genomes of you and me are individually different. And the genome in me or in you for all your or mine 100 trillion cells in a single human are different. Genome information exploded over 25 orders of magnitude. And worse, the information theory of the genome function is worse than non-existent. Two basic axioms are false. A couple of words about this, this uh, totally wrong axioms. This is a hand-scribbled version of, by Crick in 1956, um, over half a century ago, when he scribbled and then published that uh, DNA, which tra is transcribed to RNA and then it builds proteins, it, uh, it does work. But he says that it never happens that the protein information can ever go back to DNA. You know, it's not a wise thing to, to say never. You should never say never. This was a, a republication in 1970, protein. Protein is a dead end. And of course, uh, Ono said that why recurse if uh, you will only find junk? This shows that the, the, the fundamental axioms are just plain, totally wrong. The emperor has no clothes. Now, I'm very happy that I don't have to say that the emperor has no clothes, because all the emperors are dead or retired. This is why I could publish the paper, which said that there is a recursion in the genome. So basically, this was the problem. The, this, the, the black figure is Crick's Krik, figure, and then uh, uh, Central Dragon prohibited the recursion. And then uh, Ono said that even if you do go back, there is no information that is junk. So uh, therefore, there was a double uh, uh, a barrier which was there. And by yanking them out, saying that, well, it's not true, what do we have? Continuous recursion is an iterative recursion. I'd like to visualize this transition from the old paradigm. This was on the 50th anniversary of, of uh, uh, double helix. Then a scientific American uh, cover story was this, that there is a, a double helix and there is a, a, a gene. And then, of course, according to the wisdom at that time, if a gene is active, then it develops, some, uh, for instance, a, a protein structure like a brain cell. This is a brain cell. Uh, in my case, it's a Purkinje neuron. It doesn't matter too much. So the gene paradigm was a forward growth paradigm. Now then, um, uh, in hologenomics, this is redefined. Uh, this is OK. This is true that there are genes. Nobody says that genes are non-existent, although the definition is changed quite a bit. But then um, the big thing is that the growth is recursive. So then if there's a gene information. It generates a fractal template of like a little stem of this cell. And then uh, this fractal template actually recurses, the protein recurses to DNA. That was forbidden. No, it's not. Why does it do that? Because uh, it picks up information from what used to be called junk. And not only it picks up information from the recursion, but it also uh, puts in a cookie. You now it marks. It marks that information, this secondary information, that it has been used so that you don't want to use it again. 
uh, this is called methylation. Now the rest, of course, is almost automatic because in the second step, with that auxiliary information, you build this fractal template further. Now you can see that this template actually appears here and also here. This is the Lindenmeyer fractal uh, uh, growth, and that growth is supported by this iterative recursion to the genome. And then, of course, you go a couple of steps, and then Gloria has the question that now how does it stop? Growth has to be supported by, by information. And if, if you run out of information, then you recurse, but you don't find any more uh, auxiliary information, then you stop the growing. But also, you can see that if something is wrong with these cookies, for instance, this methylation didn't occur in the right way, then this already grown Purkinje cell uh, can recurse, and then it grows into even more complex something. It's called cancer. And of course, likewise, if uh, there is something wrong with the methylation that uh, a recursion would like to find, but it's not there, there is some methylation problem there, it's already methylated, then the growth is stunted. So uh, uh, in the recursion, we know the mechanisms of several very important uh, uh, pathological processes. These are, these are genetically identical mice. This, this came out just a couple of months ago with a spectacular epigen epigenomic study. And it's as simple as this, you know, watch what you eat. The Chinese knew a long, long time ago, for a couple of thousand years ago, years, that this came out in, in, a, in a scientific journal. Uh, about the methylation of tea catechins. Green tea has been suggested to have beneficial effects against many diseases, including cancer, cardiovascular disease, and Parkinson's disease. Here, the information, the understanding is not enough. Uh, but if, if, if we don't use that knowledge, then we can't help those people who are dying. Because there are hundreds, if not millions or hundred millions of people actually dying of diseases which are branded junk DNA diseases just because people are, doctors were prohibited by a dogma looking at that uh, uh, vast majority of the genome because it is called junk. So this is a life or death issue. And here we need the computation. For instance, if there is a growth and there is a biopsy. Now do you want to wait a year to establish whether it's a melanoma or it's a very mild form of, of skin cancer. No, you don't. You can't afford. You want that kind of diagnosis as quickly as possible. So you have to go for speed in sequencing. Now, this sequ some of the sequencing as of today, uh, it lasts uh, three months at least. It used to last, uh, uh, the first genome was sequenced in four years. Uh, Jim Watson was sequenced in about a year. And as of today, the state of art is that it takes about three months, mostly of computer work, assembly of these this, uh, shotgun pieces to, to put them together like a jigsaw puzzle. It just takes too long and also it's too expensive. And, uh, and the processes, as you can, we could see here, the genome itself is a massively parallel process not just one gene which acts, all of them act. It's more like an orchestra with all the instruments, all, all of them acting, but some more and some less and very dynamically. So that kind of massively parallel process of the genome uh, requires their, its match in information technology so that we can, we can deal with this beast. So this is, this, this is an issue that we ultimately we care the most about, uh, our, our well-being and, and also the well-being of our loved ones.